buttons, the core of the web, the thing you use to interface with applications, the thing that we look at, click on, change, interface with, and just consume every day. And if you look across the web, you'll see a wide range of different buttons that look and behave in all sorts of different ways. So why are we talking about this? Well, I found a cool Chrome extension that I really wanted to showcase. I know, why am I talking about a Chrome extension? Well, hear me out, this one's really cool. It's called the Button Stealer, and it does exactly what it sounds like. So if I go to my Arc, which is basically Chrome, they're based all the same, click here, click the Button Stealer, I've stolen 245 buttons so far. It would have been more, but I had the cap at 200 and I only bumped it up yesterday. Let's click my stash. And now here are a bunch of random buttons from random places I've been on the web recently. It's so cool. I actually really like this idea. It's cool to just come here as an inspiration for different buttons and button types. When you're trying to think like, how can I make this button look just right? Some of them aren't rendered properly because they rely on weird CSS and positioning stuff. I'm actually curious to see how they handle the CSS for any given button on here. So if I look at, yeah, this one. So we have the open fractal glass generator. This is for magic patterns, a really cool site I'll show in a minute. It's supposed to be there, but I'm guessing that the CSS for it has some crazy margin on it. Margin inline zero imported or important. Let's take a look here though. I am so curious where that margin is coming from. Position? That would do it. No? All the position stuff here is pretty boring by the looks of it. Nope. Line height. I tried line height. I see why this one's screwed up because there is some... Oh, it's the transform. That's it, obviously. Chat, how did y'all not catch the transform? Yeah. You should probably nuke transforms from the CSS that it's importing. But how cool is it that of like almost all of these buttons, there was just that one broken by the transform. I'm sure there's others throughout, but for the most part, it renders them all correctly. And it has to do a lot of CSS massaging to make that work. But it's succeeding and it looks great. What's really cool though, is what happens if you click one of these buttons. So if I go back to that one, it brings me to the site that I found it on. In this case, it's Magic Pattern, which is a site I've been using for my gradients for a lot of my thumbnails for a bit now. It's actually pretty cool. So it found buttons from here. Yeah, this tool is awesome. Definitely check it out if you haven't, magicpattern.design. If that's something that's interesting to you, it's a fun tool, especially if you're a graphics nerd and you're hanging out on a video like this one. But how cool is it that you just browse the web and it slowly collects all these different buttons from all these different places. And if you're curious where it came from, like we all know where this one came from, but I can click it and it will bring us right to Wouter, which is one of my favorite ways to do routing in React. I think this is awesome. I really like the idea of building something like this to collect buttons and use it as a source for inspiration, as well as a cool way to just hoard the things you explore on the internet. I wanna see if uh, they have a GitHub. I'm just curious if this is open source or not. It is. Yep, that's the same one. I'm giving this a star on GitHub, but I wanna actually read through a bit of how it works. Okay, that's kinda cool. So they have all of the default properties, like what the web would set by default. And then it goes through, it takes an element, it grabs the computed style for the element, it makes a map of all of the things from it, it grabs the styles from the parent node, it removes the style attribute from the node that we're actually working with, and then for each property of the ref that we got here, we parse through and we add it if it's inheritable, uh, if it's auto, we continue, if it's a property value of border top and it's zero, then we continue and just all of these giant checks to do its best to rip individual properties one at a time for a given button. Kind of nuts. And then I'm assuming at the end, yeah, can't steal buttons, async, buttons, maximum ignore, Chrome storage, local get buttons, maximum. Cool. So that's how they're actually checking to make sure we're not at the maximum and that we're not getting domains from an ignored site, local buttons, get code local button, if no code return, button's length, button has own property. Da, da, da. And here's where we actually add the button to the array. We unshift it so it gets put at the front instead of dot push, which we put at the back. And while the length is greater than or equal to the maximum, we pop. So this is all of the code for adding the button to the array and then pushing off old ones. And we update the storage here, upload on shift, Buttons is set to buttons, upload is set to upload.
Cool. The the amount of random shit, like, like this is why I love projects like this is you have to fight so many things because the web was not built to allow this. But it's like, how cool is it that they extract computed styles through window, grab the parent ref, and then for each single key that could affect things, they parse it and handle it that way. So cool. Let's take a look at the service worker that does a lot of this in the background. So uninstalled, this sets the local storage, the default values for everything. This is actually very important because if you try to hit a key that doesn't exist in something like local storage, it'll break in really unexpected ways especially the Chrome storage. The Chrome storage is not a shim on local storage. It's its own very strange API. It's also async, so you have to await when you hit it. Unlike local storage, you can just hit in line without issues. Counters, buttons at length, buttons dot map, button ID, counter minus minus, uh, if not contentful dot content delivery API. Also, they let you link it up to contentful. I think that's if you want to dump the buttons somewhere external. Unchanged, out event listener. If we're at the maximum, then we pop until we're not at the maximum anymore. You can upload off screen. What does this function do? Oh, it's right defined below here. Cool. Here, the upload off screen, the reason for this is so that it doesn't block the main thread on the site you're on. It can run this in a service worker in the background once the message has been generated. So if it's on Contentful, if you're bound to Contentful, it will upload it there. Afterwards, it will upload to your local storage. So Chrome runtime send message, type full sync, off screen, Contentful. Await has document. So if the document page, so like the thing you actually go to exists, then we create the document with the URL. Uh, DOM parser required it. Interesting. Makes sense, I think. Button is the last button. Upload.length minus one. Button has own property code. Then we upload the stolen button or we're removing it. So this is how we're deciding is on this event, are we adding or removing the button? And then handle messages. So this is all of the messages you can send to the Chrome service worker. If the message is stolen button uploaded, then we uh, grab it from local storage, we pop it, we send it, and then we set the local storage to no longer have this one that we're in the middle of uploading. We have a contentful synchronized update maximum. This is if you want to change the max and it just sets the state to be the message value. All the usual state setting stuff here, pretty traditional for a Chrome extension. And then you bind this at the end here so that Chrome knows to listen to your messages for your extension. All makes sense. The one thing I didn't see in here is how does it pick the button? Ah, here it is. Possible buttons. Where we get all A tags and button tags. And if we're not debugging, then we uh, possible buttons zero. Because this is the two arrays. We have the first array, which is the link tags, the second array, which is the button tags. And we sort them randomly. <laughs> so this is a random effectively for both of those. Weird way to do it, but it technically works because on any comparison, it's going to blindly return true or false. So that might actually take a while to run now that I think about it. If it's doing multiple comparisons with the sort, that could theoretically break and cause weird issues, but interesting. But J is zero. J is less than possible buttons dot length. J plus plus. And then for each button, if it's a material icon or symbol, we skip it. <laughs> If we already have this button, then we could skip it. Uh, then we grab the CSS in the computed style. Interesting, they actually have a check here. If the uh, transform is a matrix like this, then we skip it. Or if the opacity is zero, then we skip it. If the element's not in the viewport, then we continue, which is skip it. If there's no text, we skip it. Or if the word skip is in it, we skip it. If the word jump is in it, we skip it. This is actually because a lot of pages have a jump button at the top for accessibility reasons that's invisible. So just making sure they don't grab those because those buttons are weird. If it has a new line of any form, then we skip it. If the text is add, then we skip it. If it's too small, we skip it. If it's too big, we skip it. <laughs> if it has a background color of RGBA 000, we check if it has children. If it has children, we check if those also have the same RGBA 0000. If they do, we skip it. Right? Would this ever pass? Oh, yes, because if we don't see that, then we now have that and we can parse it going forward. So we're just checking if this element has any children that are a valid button. We finally get through all that. So we clone the button and then we start having all the fun with it. That makes sense. That's kind of cool. It's nice seeing how this works. And it's also awesome that it's open source. Definitely give this repo a star if you're curious about both how Chrome extensions work, and in this case, more importantly, how you actually consume things from a web page in such an absurd case. It's quite cool. I actually think this is an awesome case study of how to deal with things that the browser is not trying to help with at all. 
Like this is one of those things where like, I would love to see an AI try to write this project because there's no way it could figure out all of these workarounds and edge cases that you want to filter out of. Like just this section here of all the shit that you want to skip is so valuable. And I would never want to like figure out all of these cases myself. Like think about how much time it took to find and then handle all of these different cases. Fantastic work. This is actually a really cool project. I'm happy I took the time to dig into it. Shout out to Natalie Zenkov for writing this. It's actually really cool. I don't know if I'm following you on Twitter, but we're going to fix that because this is one of my favorite things I've seen recently. And I insist y'all go give this a star. I'll leave the link in the description. If you're as curious as I am, definitely go check it out. And until next time, peace nerds.